Nicola Sturgeon, uh, soon to become a footnote in the history of the independence movement in Scotland. We're about to speak now to Alex Salmond, former First Minister of Scotland, leader of the Alba Party, because there was yet another hustings last night. Times Radio organised one for the three contenders to be the new leader of the SNP, the new First Minister, Humza Yusuf, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan, uh, all slagging off Nicola Sturgeon now because the edifice of the SNP has simply fallen away in a quite dramatic style in the past week or so. Let's talk to Alex to find out what's going on. Alex, a very good morning to you. Good morning, mate. Thank yeah. you very Can much. I, for... say, I, was asked, I was asked to come on a programme called Independent Republic, <laughs> and I just said to myself, that's for me. Yeah, well, exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm of course, independent of everything. You know, I'm not neither part of the United Kingdom uh, nor part of Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, Wales. I rest myself somewhere offshore uh, so that I can be completely neutral in these matters. But, I mean, I have to say, some of the things that have been going on inside the SNP beg a belief. You know, uh, people have said to me um, there are things that are going to come out which could be quite shocking. Um, has, has that process begun? I mean, we've seen the, the end of Nicola Sturgeon. We've seen the end of Peter Murrell. Murray Foote, the uh, uh, the guy who was behind all the, the the press, has gone as well. What's going on? Well, there's certainly quite a few bodies floating down the river, mm. uh, not over the last uh, uh, few days. In fact, the the person who's been brought in as acting chief executive, uh, brought back from the political twilight, Mike Russell, somebody incidentally I appointed yep. uh, in 19 Oak Cake to be chief executive <laughs> a long time ago. He's described it as a a burach. Uh, which is a Scots Gaelic word, which, uh, well, it, it doesn't just mean a mess. It means a, a total, absolute, calamitous yeah. disaster. I think we'd call it so a whole down here, wouldn't we? It's a bura, yes. <laughs> It really is. And, I mean, they're all sort of running for cover, like uh, fighting like rats in a sack. They can't seem to agree really now on anything. But what they can seemingly uh, uh, say altogether is that it has been run badly, the SNP. I mean, I don't wish to, 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 uh, to blow smoke over you, but, I mean, since you left and since, I mean, we say it's three years ago to the week that you were acquitted of all those charges that were laid against you, um, the people that seem to have been behind all of that um, are sort of falling away at a rate of knots. Well, I mean, certainly the, the SNP, as we now know, because the, the point of uh, resignation of Murray Foote and Peter Murrow uh, was when it was discovered they'd been lying about the uh, uh, the membership. Mm. Uh, uh, but not just lying by a factor of 100 or 1,000, but lying by a factor of 30,000. Right. Now, Murray Foote says it wasn't him. He was given the wrong information. Peter Murrow says he, he didn't intend to mislead, but he's going to resign anyway. But obviously there was a systematic lie about the, the membership. And the importance of that, of course, it's not just like political parties doing a normal bit of exaggeration. As you're in an election campaign to be First Minister of Scotland, you know, that's not an inconsiderable thing. Mm. And the very least that the three candidates are entitled to when they're competing to be First Minister is to know the size of the electorate. Not, not to get told that the start of the contest it was 100,000 yeah. and then two-thirds of the way through, oops, it's only 70,000. Right. So it's not a small thing, this. And it does tend to indicate there's a, how shall I put it, a, a cultural problem in the mm. recent modern SNP uh, a problem of uh, consistent deception. Yes, and there does seem to be a situation going on where very few people, even in the highest echelons of, of what would be the Scottish Government, actually were, were privy to what was going on, to what decisions were being made. It's almost as though Peter Murrell and Nicola Sturgeon and a very small cabal around them were making all the decisions. Well, let's take the matter away from the, the, the three candidates. Uh, uh, incidentally, I thought in the last couple of debates they're starting to emerge much better mm. than at the start of the contest. I think uh, all three of them, uh, and I think particularly the, the two uh, uh, women candidates, yeah. uh, actually come across very well last night in the, in the Times debate, for example. Mm. But I, I was interested in the comments of, uh, of John Nicholson, uh, the SNP MP yesterday. Now, he's a, well, how shall I put it nicely for John, he's a... He, he hasn't been the most critical of the <laughs> of the SNP leadership. Right. Some people might say to the extent of fawning uh, over recent years. But yesterday, of course, he was now felt free to, to let loose and was saying that the real problem was that there was such a, a narrow focus of decision-making. They hadn't been listening to expert advice. The subtext was they hadn't been listening to John Nicholson, yes. probably. But nonetheless, right. he actually has managed to, after all these years as a parliamentarian, a light on a very serious point and that undoubtedly was one of the, 
the difficulties, just one of the difficulties that the SNP have been suffering from. Yes, and people are now writing openly uh, that basically the independence movement has been severely damaged by by this latest kind of stramash, which is what, which is what I'm calling it, another it's a nice Scottish word that I quite like, um, because independence seems to have been forgotten about because you know during covid and, and of course everybody will give certain people a bit of rope because it was a pandemic and nobody was quite sure what was going on but it seemed as though nicola sturgeon um, and i don't want to make this all about her became absolutely sort of uh, enthralled with her own importance and became and we've just heard from jason leach that you know it might have been a mistake to shut the schools you know it's all it's all of its unraveling yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the word stramash. The, the, this was a word made famous by the late Arthur Monfort, a right. very famous uh, He was a friend of my dad's, funnily enough. He used to play golf with <laughs> him. Commentator <laughs> who, who used to describe uh, goal mouth uh, incidents as stramash yes. in the goal mouth. So you didn't entirely waste your time in Scotland. Uh, no. Like, uh, but yes, it has been a stramash, and certainly there's been an element of damage. But you have to be aware of, and I'm not, this is not addressed to you, Mike, because uh, you did you 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 served your time at the at the coalface in Scotland. Uh. You know the issues much better than many London commentators. Yes, and I think you've got some ancestral ties to Scotland as well. Mm. But you, you you do get network London commentators who cannot hide their glee that you know that this might mean that the national movement in Scotland is dead and buried. That yeah. these pest thoughts are. You know, they've rid themselves of these turbulent Scots. Right. I think they're entirely misreading the situation. Yes, of course, uh, problems in the leading independence party do represent problems for the independence movement. But the independence movement is by far the most powerful force in Scottish politics. Uh, and if you look over the medium term as opposed to very short term factors, uh, then you can see that it, it's growing and probably growing irresistibly because of the generational changes. Uh, as Scotland has developed. So I think the, the London commentators who think, well, my goodness, we've seen the last of this independence nonsense, they are vastly... I mean, I, I think that complacency mm. is to be welcomed, incidentally, because next yes. time independence roars back, they'll be caught by yes. surprise. Yeah, no, I don't think by any means that it's, that it's disappeared. I mean, I'm just saying that I think it, it, has been, it has been dealt a blow because it was only seemingly, I think, within the last few months that, that Nicola Sturgeon was trying to get a second referendum through the Supreme Court in London. Uh, when she failed, as she, she must have known she would, she said, well, the next election will then be, uh, a, for me, a sort of de facto independence referendum because she knew she would win the next election because the SNP probably will even despite all of this. But, you know, it just seems to have set it all back a bit is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, obviously, uh, Nicola drove up a cul-de-sac last year by going to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom to ask for advice on how to dissolve the United Kingdom. Now, you wouldn't have to be a legal genius to, to suggest that perhaps the right people to ask for advice on how to dissolve the United Kingdom is not to ask an institution <laughs> whose entire existence is about the United Kingdom. I mean, no, it's like going to the BBC to, to ask for advice on independence campaigning tactics. Yes. <laughs> You know, the name's on the tin. It's the British Broadcasting Corporation. They, they don't intrinsically like the idea of Scottish independence, despite, despite you know, they always say they're impartial and all the rest of it. But we actually know that's not true. So that indication, going to the Supreme Court, was a, a huge misstep. Uh, and, you know, normally Nicholas Sturgeon was a very sure-footed politician, yeah. a very cautious politician uh, in many ways. Uh, and that was a sign that things were going off the rails. And then, of course, we went into the whole transgender reform debate yeah. where somebody of you know substantial communication skills that Nicola Sturgeon has uh, you know is totally unable to describe uh, uh, a man pretending to be a, a woman to get into a to a female prison yeah. uh, who's a double rapist uh, uh, as anything other than than what he was yeah. and and when you, you you become I mean the problem with that of course is there was a number of interviews where you know, commentators, particularly London commentators, for the very first time started to laugh at the Scottish yes. First Minister. Uh, yeah. And that, that, I mean, you can't, I mean, you can have people who are your opponents, you know, fearing you, criticising you, attacking you, trying to run you down, but the one thing you mustn't have is ridicule. Mm. <clears throat> and how Nicola got herself into the position uh, of not being able to articulate, uh, you know, if, if you have a policy position that even a 
a master of communications can't articulate, it might be a clue it's the wrong policy position. Yes. I mean, a lot of people also say that her uh, coalition with Patrick Harvey and the Green Party was not the wisest decision that she had made either, because that was kind of where all that gender stuff started. Um, some have said that if, certainly if Kate Forbes becomes the leader, that might all disappear and the Greens might no longer be part of all of that. What are you hearing about that situation? Well, I mean, certainly <clears throat> there is an argument that many of the Scottish government's difficulties over recent months had a, <laughs> had a green tinge to them. Uh, you know, there were, let, let's put it this way, there were green fingers all over them, not, not just the transgender debate, but the alienation of oil and gas workers in the, the northeast of Scotland, the, the fairly ridiculous deposit return scheme uh, for bottles and cans. Incident, incidentally, an idea that probably everybody supports in principle, thinks is a good idea, but you really got to have some inkling that you can put it forward in practice mm. uh, if you're going to introduce it. And when they were, and probably also the duelling of the A9. I don't underrate that. I mean, that was a, a historic promise made by the SNP, made by my administration back in 2007 first and carried forward uh, and suddenly, well, not suddenly abandoned, progressively abandoned. And, you know, a lot of people in the Highlands felt deeply upset. And it just, I don't think, I think it's more than a coincidence that the, you know, the Green Party don't really want to build any roads anywhere, no. any time, um, they go anywhere, even if they're in electric vehicles, which they should be. No, indeed. Well, they'd rather they just, well, just let them grow over, I think. I think that's what they prefer. And what about your own situation? I mean, is this an opportunity for Alba uh, to become a bigger force? I mean, I know you were asked way back um, when, when you and I first met up again over in the TV studios that, uh, you know, would you sort of, you know, join together and lead an independence movement as such? Um, are people still asking you that question? Is the answer still that you don't really want to be the leader of it? Well, I mean, the, the SNP is the predominant independence party. I think ALAPA have a vital role to play, uh, you know, to keep the independence flame burning uh, when the SNP starts to uh, go off and talk about other things. You know, I mean, as I put it, <laughs> the, the SNP seem fascinated by self-identification and no longer interested in self-determination yeah. for Scotland. Well, you but, might say they're not even self-identifying anymore as independence uh, zealots. Well, well, that, well, that's, that is the problem. Now, a lot depends on the leadership election. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't share, incidentally, uh, I mean, Humza Yusuf is very sensitive about my comments. He thinks I shouldn't be commenting on who should be the next First Minister of Scotland. But actually, I'm not anything like as critical uh, as many people have been. Because I, I think within these candidates, there is a lot of substance. I, I think Ash Reagan has put forward a, a very a sensible, uh, well-worked-out independent strategy, which SNP clearly needs. I think Kate Forbes is a breath of fresh air in many ways. I, I mean, a naturally gifted uh, young woman who is clearly uh, you know, a, a substantial politician. And I think Hamza Yusuf, well, how shall I bet it put it so Hamza doesn't get upset again? Uh, it's not as bad as people are saying. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the Times debate last night, now a lot will depend on what happens in the future as to the outcome of this election. Whether the SNP decides it's going to offer the hand of friendship to not just other independence parties, but the whole variety of grassroots uh, organisations and think tanks who have been basically shut out of decision making. Whether there's going to be the hand of friendship through an independence convention where everybody can get together. Because if you're going to take on and beat the Westminster establishment, the first thing you should do is unite the independence forces so that we're all together taking on and beating the Westminster establishment. Mm. Or alternatively, if it's going to be, you know, just the <laughs> recent history, the continuity SNP and continuity in the memorable words of one of the candidates in this election won't cut it because continuity has been leading to faltering uh, or at least static support for independence, uh, a dramatic decline in SNP membership, uh, and you cannot just go on like that. You have to have something new and better to right. offer. Now, if that better offer is an independence convention, then Alapa will be very proud to play our part, whatever that is, in that convention. And then, of course, that would also allow, this is a great benefit, the SNP politicians to get on with the job, which is really, really important, of running Scotland fairly, wisely, and above all, competently, if the independence campaign is being progressed through an independence campaign. Well, and how about in, in a transparent manner, which doesn't appear to have been going on much either, because a lot of people are concerned that this is not where it ends, that, in fact, Nicola Sturgeon, for some bizarre reason, I finished my show the other day, went outside the studio, and there she was on Loose Women, 
which I thought was an interesting uh, place to go to make her case. But uh, she claims, um, <laughs> despite various um, uh, suggestions, that she can't comment on any police investigation. That turned into um, some commentators saying, well, she says she hasn't heard from the police. She didn't actually say that. She said, um, I can't comment on any police investigations. I never have uh, and I never will. But, you know, there is certainly some kind of investigation going on and that may mean that any continuity that you want to have from Nicola Sturgeon's era, uh, you wouldn't actually want to have. Yes, I, I think, how shall I put it, without uh, impeding on... I'm, I'm not going to criticise Nicola Sturgeon for going on television programmes. I'm the last person <laughs> in the world to criticise politicians for going on television programmes. Uh, but, uh, look, uh, without uh, prejudicing any current inquiries, mm. uh, if I were standing for SNP leader and were successful at the present moment, which clearly I'm not, but if I were doing that and I was uh, successfully elected, then I think the first thing I would do uh, is bring a, a, a team of my own uh, accountants into SNP headquarters uh, so there was a very clear demarcation line between the starting point of uh, of the new leader mm. and what had gone before, because uh, regardless of who's elected, uh, I think the indications are they want to have that demarcation line, because no new leader wants to be burdened with uh, the potential misdeeds of the past. No, indeed. Absolutely. Well, it's a fascinating situation. We shall keep uh, our eyes on it, and we'll talk to you, I'm sure, again very soon, Alex, about it. On Boris, uh, story, is he going to... Is he going to be one bound and free yet well, again? I mean, or is he going to ask for... I mean, Boris Johnson misleading Parliament. I mean, who would have thought that was possible? I, I think you should go in there and ask for another 100 offences to be taken <laughs> into account. Get well, off with a... I mean, he's kind of kiboshed the... Uh, he's kind of, in, in true Boris fashion, he's sort of kiboshed the, the, the whole inquiry because he's already admitted to doing it. So now that you've got to prove not that he did it, but that he meant to do it, which is a lot harder to do. Yeah, well, you never know. I mean, uh, I, I, it's, it's not uh, it's not necessarily somebody to back against. But you see this whole Northern Irish thing, Mike? Yeah. You know, here's an example of a, an opportunity for the SNP and the independence movement right now. Uh, you know, as, as I, mean, I, I saw Trevor Kavanagh <laughs> instilling a bit of mischief with you yeah. earlier on. I mean, you know, what, what Scotland should be saying right now is we'll go into the agreement as well. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe that would make the democratic unionists feel better if somebody else was... Uh, it was in it. And then, of course, we would have, in Boris Johnson's famous words, the best of both worlds. Right. Free access to the single market and preferred well, access to the I mean, this market. was, you know, the extreme, this is what I always say to people, you know, when people say about Rishi Sunak, he's a very clever man. I mean, not that clever, because he actually announced himself to, to favour the, the best of both worlds, which was to be not only in the single market, but to be in the, in the UK market as well. And everybody, of course, who voted to, to remain said, well, why can't we have that? You're badly missed in Scotland. <laughs> well, maybe I'll come up and do a tour. But listen, good to talk to you, Alex. We'll talk to you again soon, very soon, I'm sure. Alex Salmon, former First Minister of Scotland, leader, of course, of the Albert Party. There's some very, very weird goings-on uh, going on up there, uh, north of the border.